The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells Chapter 15 The Man Who Was Running In the early evening time, Dr. Kemp was sitting in his study in the Belvedere on the hill overlooking Burdock. It was a pleasant little room with three windows, north, west and south, and bookshelves covered with books and scientific publications, and a broad writing table, and underneath the north window, a microscope, glass slips, minute instruments, some cultures, and scattered bottles of reagents. Dr. Kemp's solar lamp was lit, albeit the sky was still bright with the sunset light, and his blinds were up, because there was no offence of peering outsiders to require them pulled down. Dr. Kemp was a tall and slender young man, with flaxen hair and a moustache almost white, and the work he was upon would earn him, he hoped, the fellowship of the Royal Society, so highly did he think of it. And his eye, presently wandering from his work, caught the sunset blazing at the back of the hill that is over against his own. For a minute, perhaps, he sat, pen in mouth, admiring the rich golden colour above the crest, and then his attention was attracted by the little figure of a man, inky black, running over the hill-brow towards him. He was a shortish little man, and he wore a high hat, and he was running so fast that his legs verily twinkled. "'Another of those fools,' said Dr. Kemp, "'like that ass who ran into me this morning around a corner with visible man a-coming, sir. "'I can't imagine what possesses people. "'One might think we were in the thirteenth century.' "'He got up, went to the window, and stared at the dusky hillside "'and the dark little figure tearing down it. "'He seems in a confounded hurry,' said Dr. Kemp. "'But he doesn't seem to be getting on. "'If his pockets were full of lead, he couldn't run heavier.' "'Spurted, sir,' said Dr. Kemp. In another moment the higher of the villas that had clambered up the hill from Burdock had occluded the running figure. He was visible again for a moment, and again, and then again, three times between the three detached houses that came next, and then the terrace hid him. "'Asses,' said Dr. Kemp, swinging around on his heel and walking back to his writing-table. But those who saw the fugitive nearer and perceived the abject terror on his perspiring face, being themselves in the open roadway, did not share in the doctor's contempt. The man pounded, and as he ran he chinked like a well-filled purse that is tossed to and fro. He looked neither to the right nor the left, but his dilated eyes stared straight downhill to where the lamps were being lit and the people were crowded in the street, and his ill-shaped mouth fell apart and a glary foam lay on his lips, and his breath came hoarse and noisy. All he passed stopped and began staring up the road and down, and interrogating one another with an inkling of discomfort for the reason of his haste. And then presently, far up the hill, a dog playing in the road yelped and ran under a gate, and as they still wondered something, a wind, a pad-pad-pad, a sound like a panting breathing, rushed by. People screamed, people sprang off the pavement, it passed in shouts, it passed by instinct down the hill. They were shouting in the street before Marvel was halfway there. They were bolting into houses and slamming the doors behind them, and with the news. He heard it and made one last desperate spurt. Fear came striding by, rushed ahead of him, and in a moment had seized the town. The invisible man is coming, the invisible man. Chapter 16 in the Jolly Cricketers. The Jolly Cricketers is just at the bottom of the hill where the tram lines begin. The barman leant his fat red arms on the counter and talked of horses with an anemic cabman, while a black-bearded man in a grey snapped up biscuit and cheese, drank Burton, and conversed in American with a policeman off duty. "'What's the shouting about?' said the anemic cabman, going off at a tangent, trying to see up the hill over the dirty yellow blind in the low window of the inn. Somebody ran by outside. "'Fire, perhaps,' said the barman. Footsteps approached, running heavily. The door was pushed open violently, and Marvel, weeping and dishevelled, his hat gone, the neck of his coat torn open, rushed in, made a convulsive turn, and attempted to shut the door. It was half held open by a strap. "'Coming!' he bawled, his voice shrieking with terror. "'He's coming, the visible man! After me, for God's sake, help, help, help!' "'Shut the doors,' said the policeman, 
Who's coming? What's the row? He went to the door, released the strap, and it slammed. The American closed the other door. Let me go inside, said Marvel, staggering and weeping, but still clutching the books. Let me go inside. Lock me in somewhere. I tell you, he's after me. I gave him the slip. He said he'd kill me, and he will. You're safe, said the man with the black beard. The door's shut. What's it all about? Let me go inside, said Marvel, and shrieked aloud as a blow suddenly made the fastened door shiver, and was followed by a hurried rapping and a shouting outside. Hello, cried the policeman. Who's there? Mr. Marvel began to make frantic dives at panels that looked like doors. He'll kill me. He's got a knife or something, for God's sake. Here you are, said the barman. Come in here. And he held up the flap of the bar. Mr. Marvel rushed behind the bar as the summons outside was repeated. "'Don't open the door!' he screamed. "'Please don't open the door! Where shall I hide?' "'This, this invisible man, then?' asked the man with the black beard, with one hand behind him. "'I guess it's about time we saw him.' The window of the inn was suddenly smashed in, and there was a screaming and running to and fro in the street. The policeman had been standing on the settee, staring out, craning to see who was at the door. He got down with raised eyebrows. "'It's that,' he said. The barman stood in front of the bar parlour, which was now locked, on Mr. Marvel, stared at the smashed window, and came around to the other two men. Everything was suddenly quiet. "'I wish I had my truncheon,' said the policeman, going irresolutely to the door. Once we open, in he comes. There's no stopping him. "'Don't you be in too much hurry about that door,' said the anaemic cabman, anxiously. "'Draw the bolts,' said the man with the black beard. "'And if he comes?' He showed a revolver in his hand. "'That won't do,' said the policeman. "'That's murder.' "'I know what country I'm in,' said the man with the beard. "'I'm going to let off at his legs. Draw the bolts.' "'Not with that blinking thing going off behind me,' said the barman, craning over the blind. "'Very well,' said the man with the black beard, and stooping down, revolver ready, drew himself. Barman, cabman, and policeman faced about. "'Come in,' said the bearded man in an undertone, standing back and facing the unbolted doors with his pistol behind him. No one came in. The door remained closed. Five minutes afterwards, when a second cabman pushed his head in cautiously, they were still waiting, and an anxious face peered out of the bar parlour and supplied information. "'Are all the doors of the house shut?' asked Marvel. "'He's going round, prowling round. He's as artful as the devil.' "'Good Lord,' said the burly barman. "'There's the back. Just watch them doors, I say.' He looked about him helplessly. The bar parlour door slammed, and they heard the key turn. "'There's the yard door and the private door. The yard door—' he rushed out of the bar. In a minute he reappeared with a carving knife in his hand. The yard door was open, he said, and his fat underlip dropped. He may be in the house now, said the first cabman. He's not in the kitchen, said the barman. There's two women there, and I've stabbed every inch of it with his little beef slicer, and they don't think he's come in. They haven't noticed. Have you fastened it? asked the first cabman. I'm out of frocks, said the barman. The man with the beard replaced his revolver, and even as he did so the flap of the bar was shut down and the bolt clicked, and then with a tremendous thud the catch of the door snapped and the bar parlour door pursed open. They heard Marvel squeal like a caught leverage, and forthwith they were clambering over the bar to his rescue. The bearded man's revolver cracked, and the looking-glass at the back of the parlour starred and came smashing and tinkling down. As the barman entered the room he saw Marvel curiously crumpled up and struggling against the door that led to the yard and kitchen. The door flew open while the barman hesitated, and Marvel was dragged into the kitchen. There was a scream and a clatter of pans. Marvel, head down and lugging back obstinately, was forced to the kitchen door, and the bolts were drawn. Then the policeman, who had been trying to pass the barman, rushed in, followed by one of the cabmen, grabbed the wrist of the invisible hand that collared Marvel, was hit in the face and went reeling back. The door opened, and Marvel made a frantic effort to obtain a lodgment behind it. Then the cabman collared something. "'I got him!' said the cabman. The barman's red hands came clawing at the unseen. "'Here he is,' said the barman. 
Mr. Marvel, released, suddenly dropped to the ground and made an attempt to crawl behind the legs of the fighting men. The struggle blundered around the edge of the door. The voice of the invisible man was heard for the first time, yelling out sharply as the policeman trod on his foot. Then he cried out passionately and his fists flew round like flails. The cabman suddenly whooped and doubled up, kicked under the diaphragm. The door into the bar parlour from the kitchen slammed and covered Mr. Marvel's retreat. The men in the kitchen found themselves clutching at and struggling with empty air. "'Where is he gone?' cried the man with the beard. "'Out?' "'This way,' said the policeman, stepping into the yard and stopping. A piece of tile whizzed by his head and smashed among the crockery on the kitchen table. "'I'll show him,' shouted the man with the black beard, and suddenly a steel barrel shone over the policeman's shoulder, and five bullets had followed one another into the twilight whence the missile had come. As he fired, the man with the beard moved his hand in a horizontal curve, so that his shots radiated out into the narrow yard like spokes from a wheel. A silence followed. Five cartridges, said the man with the black beard. That's the best of all. Four aces and a joker. Get a lantern, someone, and come and feel about for his body. Chapter 17 Dr. Kemp's Visitor Dr. Kemp had continued writing in his study until the shots aroused him. Crack, 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 they came, one after another. Hello, said Dr. Kemp, putting his pen into his mouth again and listening. Who's letting revolvers off in Burdock? What are the asses at now? He went to the south window, threw it up, and leaning out, stared down on the network of windows, beaded gas lamps and shops, with its black interstices of roof and yard that made up the town at night. "'Looks like a crowd down the hill,' he said. "'By the cricketers!' and remained watching. Thence his eyes wandered over the town to far away where the ship's lights shone, and the pier glowed, a little illuminated faceted pavilion like a gem of yellow light. The moon in his first quarter hung over the westward hill, and the stars were clear and almost tropically bright. After five minutes, during which his mind had travelled into a remote speculation of social conditions of the future, and lost itself at last over the time dimension, Dr. Kemp roused himself with a sigh, pulled down the window again, and returned to his writing desk. It must have been about an hour after this that the front doorbell rang. He had been writing slackly and with intervals of abstraction since the shots. He sat listening. He heard the servant answer the door, and waited for her feet on the staircase, but she did not come. "'Wonder what that was,' said Dr. Kemp. He tried to resume his work, failed, got up, went downstairs from his study to the landing, rang, and called over the balustrade to the housemaid as she appeared in the hall below. "'Was that a letter?' he asked. "'Only a runaway ring, sir,' she answered. "'I'm restless tonight,' he said to himself. He went back to his study, and this time attacked his work resolutely. In a little while he was hard at work again and the only sounds in the room were the ticking of the clock and the subdued shrillness of his quill, hurrying in the very centre of the circle of light his lampshade threw on his table. It was two o'clock before Dr. Kemp had finished his work for the night. He rose, yawned, and went downstairs to bed. He had already removed his coat and vest when he noticed that he was thirsty. He took a candle and went down to the dining room in search of a siphon and whisky. Dr. Kemp's scientific pursuits have made him a very observant man, and as he recrossed the hall he noticed a dark spot on the linoleum near the mat at the foot of the stairs. He went on upstairs, and then it suddenly occurred to him to ask himself what the spot on the linoleum might be. Apparently some subconscious element was at work. At any rate, he turned with his burden, went back to the hall, put down the siphon and whisky, and, bending down, touched the spot. Without any great surprise, he found it had the stickiness and colour of drying blood. He took up his burden again and returned upstairs, looking about him and trying to account for the blood spot. On the landing he saw something and stopped astonished. The door handle of his own room was blood-stained. He looked at his own hand. It was quite clean, and then he remembered the door of his room had been open when he came down from his study, and that consequently he had not touched the handle at all. He went straight into his room, his face quite calm, perhaps a trifle more resolute than usual. His glance, wandering inquisitively, fell on the bed. 
On the counterpane was a mess of blood, and the sheet had been torn. He had not noticed this before, because he had walked straight to the dressing-table. On the further side, the bedclothes were depressed, as if someone had recently been sitting there. Then he had an odd impression that he heard a low voice say, "'Good heavens, Kemp!' But Dr. Kemp was no believer in voices. He stood staring at the tumbled sheets. Was that really a voice? He looked about again, but noticed nothing further than the disordered and blood-stained bed. Then he distinctly heard a movement across the room, near the wash-hand stand. All men, however highly educated, retained some superstitious inklings. The feeling that is called eerie came upon him. He closed the door of the room, came forward to the dressing-table, and put down his burdens. Suddenly, with a start, he perceived a coiled and blood-stained bandage of linen rag hanging in mid-air between him and the wash-hand stand. He stared at this in amazement. It was an empty bandage, a bandage properly tied, but quite empty. He would have advanced to grasp it, but a touch arrested him, and a voice speaking quite close to him. Kemp, said the voice. Eh? said Kemp, with his mouth open. Keep your nerve, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Kemp made no answer for a space, simply stared at the bandage. Invisible man, he said. I am an invisible man, repeated the voice. The story he had been active to ridicule only that morning rushed through Kemp's brain. He does not appear to have been either very much frightened or very greatly surprised at the moment. Realization came later. I thought it was all a lie, he said. The thought uppermost in his mind was the reiterated arguments of the morning. Have you a bandage on? he asked. Yes, said the invisible man. Oh, said Kemp, and then roused himself. I say, he said, but this is nonsense. It's some trick. He stepped forward suddenly, and his hand, extended towards the bandage, met invisible fingers. He recoiled at the touch, and his colour changed. Keep steady, Kemp, for God's sake. I want help badly. Stop. The hand gripped his arm. He struck at it. Kemp, cried the voice. Kemp, keep steady. And the grip tightened. A frantic desire to free himself took possession of Kemp. The hand of the bandaged arm gripped his shoulder, and he was suddenly tripped and flung backwards upon the bed. He opened his mouth to shout, and the corner of the sheet was thrust between his teeth. The invisible man had him down grimly, but his arms were free, and he struck and tried to kick savagely. "'Listen to reason, will you?' said the invisible man, sticking to him in spite of a pounding in the ribs. "'By heaven, you'll madden me in a minute!' "'Lie still, you fool!' bawled the invisible man in Kemp's ear. Kemp struggled for another moment, and then lay still. "'If you shout, I'll smash your face!' said the invisible man, relieving his mouth. I'm an invisible man. It's no foolish and no magic. I really am an invisible man, and I want your help. I don't want to hurt you, but if you behave like a frantic rustic, I must. Don't you remember me, Kemp? Griffin of University College? Let me get up, said Kemp. I'll stop where I am, and let me sit quiet for a minute. He sat up and felt his neck. I am Griffin of University College, and I have made myself invisible. I am just an ordinary man, a man you have known, made invisible. Griffin, said Kemp. Griffin, answered the voice, a younger student than you were, almost an albino, six feet high and broad, with a pink and white face and red eyes, who won the medal for chemistry. I am confused, said Kemp. My brain is rioting. What has this to do with Griffin? I am Griffin. Kemp thought. It's horrible, he said, but what devilry must happen to make a man invisible? It's no devilry, it's a process, sane and intelligible enough. It's horrible, said Kemp. How on earth? It's horrible enough, but I am wounded and in pain and tired. Great God, Kemp, you're a man. Take it steady. Give me some food and drink and let me sit down here. Kemp stared at the bandage as it moved across the room, then saw a basket chair dragged across the floor and come to rest near the bed. It creaked, and the seat was depressed by the quarter of an inch or so. He rubbed his eyes and felt his neck again. <laughs> "'This beats ghosts,' he said, and laughed stupidly. 
That's better. Thank heaven you're getting sensible. <laughs> or silly, said Kemp, and knuckled his eyes. Give me some whisky. I'm near dead. It didn't feel so. Where are you? If I get up, shall I run into you? There. All right. Whisky. Here. Where shall I give it to you? The chair creaked, and Kemp felt the glass drawn away from him. He let go by an effort. His instinct was all against it. It came to rest, poised twenty inches above the front edge of the seat of the chair. He stared at it in infinite perplexity. This is... this must be hypnotism. You have suggested you are invisible. Nonsense, said the voice. It's frantic. Listen to me. I demonstrated conclusively this morning, began Kemp, that invisibility... Never mind what you've demonstrated. I'm starving, said the voice, and the night is chilly to a man without clothes. Food? said Kemp. The tumbler of whisky tilted itself. Yes, said the invisible man, wrapping it down. Have you a dressing gown? Kemp made some exclamation in an undertone. He walked to a wardrobe and produced a robe of dingy scarlet. This do? he asked. It was taken from him. It hung limp for a moment in mid-air, fluttered weirdly, stood full and decorously buttoning itself, and sat down in his chair. Drawers, socks, slippers would be a comfort, said the unseen curtly, and food. Anything, but this is the insanest thing I was ever in, in my life. He turned out his drawers for the articles, and then went downstairs to ransack his larder. He came back with some cold cutlets and bread, pulled up a light table and placed them before his guest. Never mind knives, said his visitor, and a cutlet hung in mid-air with a sound of gnawing. Invisible, said Kemp, and sat down on a bedroom chair. I always like to get something about me before I eat, said the invisible man, with a full mouth, eating greedily. Queer fancy. I suppose that wrist is all right, said Kemp. Trust me, said the invisible man. Of all the strange and wonderful. Exactly. But it's odd I should blunder into your house to get my bandaging. My first stroke of luck. Anyhow, I meant to sleep in this house tonight. You must stand that. It's a filthy nuisance, my blood showing, isn't it? Quite a clot over there. Gets visible as it coagulates, you see. It's the only living tissue I've changed, and only for as long as I'm alive. I've been in the house three hours. But how's it done? began Kemp in a tone of exasperation. Confound it! The whole business! It's unreasonable from beginning to end. Quite reasonable, said the invisible man. Perfectly reasonable. He reached over and secured the whisky bottle. Kemp stared at the devouring dressing gown. A ray of candlelight penetrating a torn patch in the right shoulder made a triangle of light under the left ribs. Where are the shots? he asked. How did the shooting begin? There was a real fool of a man, a sort of confederate of mine, curse him, who tried to steal my money, has done so. Is he invisible too? No. Well, can't I have some more to eat before I tell you all that? I'm hungry, in pain, and you want me to tell stories. Kemp got up. You didn't do any shooting? He asked. Not me, said his visitor. Some fool I'd never seen fired at random. A lot of them got scared. They all got scared at me. Curse them. I say, I want more to eat than this, Kemp. I'll see what there is to eat downstairs, said Kemp. Not much, I'm afraid. After he had done eating and he had made a heavy meal, the invisible man demanded a cigar. He bit the end savagely before Kemp could find a knife and cursed when the outer leaf loosened. It was strange to see him smoking. His mouth and throat, pharynx and nares, became visible as a sort of whirling smoke cast. This blessed gift of smoking, he said, and puffed vigorously. I am lucky to have fallen upon you, Kemp. You must help me. Fancy tumbling on you just now. I'm in a devilish scrape. I've been mad, I think. The things I've been through. But we will do things yet. Let me tell you. He helped himself to more whisky and soda. Kemp got up, looked about him, and fetched a glass from his spare room. It's wild, but I suppose I may drink. You haven't changed much, Kemp, these dozen years. You fair men don't. Cool and methodical, after the first collapse. I must tell you, we will work together. But how was it all done, said Kemp, and how did you get like this? For God's sake, let me smoke in peace for a little while, and then I will begin to tell you. But the story was not told that night. The invisible man's wrist was growing painful. He was feverish, exhausted, and his mind came round to brood upon his chase down the hill and the struggle about the inn. He spoke in fragments of marvel. He smoked faster. His voice grew angry. Kemp tried to gather what he could. He was afraid of me. I could see that he was afraid of me. 
said the Invisible Man many times over. He meant to give me the slip. He was always casting about. What a fool I was. The cur. I should have killed him. Where did you get the money? asked Kemp abruptly. The Invisible Man was silent for a space. I can't tell you tonight, he said. He groaned suddenly and leant forward, supporting his invisible head on invisible hands. Kemp, he said, I've had no sleep for near three days except a couple of doses an hour. I must sleep soon. Well, have my room, have this room. But how can I sleep? If I sleep, he will get away. Oh, what does it matter? What's the shot wound? asked Kemp abruptly. Nothing. Scratch and blood. Oh, God, how I want sleep. Why not? The invisible man appeared to be regarding Kemp. Because I've a particular objection to being caught by my fellow men, he said slowly. Kemp started. Fool that I am, said the invisible man, striking the table smartly. I've put the idea into your head. End of chapter 17 Read in Nottingham, England on the 5th of April 2006 by Alex Foster www.alexfoster.me.uk